Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session. Today we have with us Dr. Tam Cummings and this is the second part of her series in the journey in dementia. So let me tell you just a little bit about Dr. Cummings before she gets started with the presentation. Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with the mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Tam, we're so glad you're with us today. Oh, and before I get it, and are our hospice group here? Well, um, I don't think so. Candace, are you on with us today? Okay, well, we are being sponsored today by Vitas Healthcare, and I want to tell you just a moment about them. They provide hospice services, and they're in 13 states in the United States. And so if you are in need of hospice care, hospice services, look up Vitas, V-I-T-A-S, healthcare in your area to see if they are there. Uh, we certainly do appreciate their sponsorship. Oh, there she is. You hear me doing my spiel, Candace? Yes, you're so good at it. Sorry, my <laughs> finger slipped right as I was trying to push unmute. Ah, um, but okay. you you stole the show. You don't even need me. Yes, we do. Go ahead, <laughs> Candace, and then tell people about VTOS. Yes, yeah, sorry to, to interrupt. Um, but maybe your husband or wife's symptoms started months or years ago. They struggled to find words that used to come easily. They had trouble recognizing longtime friends or even the names of cherished family members. They forgot where they put something or hid other items around the house for no reason. Maybe your wife forgot how to use the washing machine or your husband forgot how to use an electric drill or your partner can no longer remember how to cook their favorite meal. Sometimes the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and dementia start long before the reality sets in that this will be your new normal for months and years to come. While there will be many more challenges ahead, you can take comfort in knowing that other spouses, family members, friends, and members of your VTOS healthcare team understand what you're going through and what's ahead for you as well. At VTOS, we specialize in this type of care for more than 40 years and we're eager to share our knowledge and self-help tips so that you can take better care of yourself while you take care of the one that you love. If you're interested in more information or even a consultation with the VTOS, you can dial 1-800-723-3233 or visit us at www.vtos.com. Look Thank how hard so working much. she is. She's coming to us from her car. She is. is. You know what? I'm impressed. I'm so excited because I'm driving to Dallas to help raise fund the fundraiser for the Wellmed Charitable Foundation. The Way first to go. In Dallas, Fort Worth. I'm on my way. Mm -hmm. All right, Candace, do good for us. The Talal is still Thank a you. borough, just so you know. They're still sitting there. <laughs> you know, the highway patrol is always at Hillsboro when you make that oh. decision. <laughs> Go down, Candace. Uh, Thank you, you too. Bye. Thanks, Candace. Be Bye. safe. Bye. All right, Dr. Cummings, are you ready to rock and roll? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm actually right. a, Let's uh, go. Grand, I'm at a grand opening of a town square in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, some friends of mine own it. And so there's a whole bunch of people walking by. I'm in the office that they've put all the dogs in. So there may be just some disruptions. Somebody may wander in, but we'll do the best we can. This <laughs> is going to be uh, the entire hour to get us through this stuff. And I apologize for last month. Um, you, Glendy, do you remember when the worst thing a teenager could bring home was uh, mono? Oh, no, I was thinking about a boyfriend or a girlfriend. <laughs> that would be the worst. Well, the teenager brought home COVID and oh. uh, went for two and a half weeks. But then finally, someone came around me and sniffed. And the next thing you knew, I was sick. So I apologize because we did start um, this series two months ago. And this is uh, very difficult for families because we have no written way to do this the way that they do with cancer. And we're just not there yet. But Hopefully this will help you realize some things that you're gonna to need to do as, as you get ready to go uh, with your loved one. So you have to remember as we do a little bit of review 
that families have changed. Uh, we now have blended families. We went from having a, what was considered sort of the universal mom dad family to totally different families. Social expectations have changed. In the past where we would have done something one way, um, we now do it a totally different way. And so those things have changed and it is just simply a, a different world. Families no longer live next to each other. Uh, your children may live on the other side of the country or the other side of the world. And so those things have changed and have made uh, what we do much more difficult uh, in terms of taking care of a loved one with a, with a terminal brain disease. Now, this may be the slideshow, Glenda, where I accidentally have everything coming across as curtains. And if it is, I want to go ahead and apologize now for that. That is my lack of ability. So it's just very complex. Who is our family? Who makes up our family? And how does our family see the process of dementia and their loved one? And we'll discuss that as well. Oh, it is. It's the one I've made where yeah. everything is curtains. Weasel. Glenda. Regardless of our family, so many of us have that weasel family member that we can't trust. We can't trust with medicines. We can't trust them to show up and do care. We can't trust them to be there when they told us they were. And it, it doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. It's just some of us are weasels. And again, remember that when we talked about this at first, you, the adult child, or you, the spouse, you knew something was wrong, but you couldn't get anybody to talk about it. And that added to your stress level and then for others of you you had to actually wait for a, a, some sort of medical event to happen before you were able to act and get your person from a home to a hospital and into care and that Glenda is not at all unusual for families but how horrible to know your person needs help and you can't get them help and the only way you can do it is to sit and wait for something terrible to happen. And how much stress does that put on you? Right? Does that make sense, Glenda? Absolutely, a lot of stress. And then as this stress is going on, you've begun to notice that the vacancy that you occasionally saw in their eyes is now becoming longer and longer. And when you see that vacancy in the eyes, the person you knew isn't there anymore. And we sort of, we call it going into themselves, that we're, they're losing the ability to be engaged with the world outside of them. And because of brain damage, that vacancy in their eyes gets longer and longer and you're not imagining it, you are seeing it. Now, Glenda, the interesting thing was when I went to do the research for this originally, there tended to be these five themes in dementia care. And I'm talking about the major research that's been done. And if you'll remember back in our first one, uh, the beginning part of this journey, we talked about not these things, we talked about as you begin to notice something is wrong with your loved one. And then you try to confront what's wrong with your loved one and you get slammed down. You don't get support from the other parent. You certainly are not getting support from the person with dementia because they don't understand it. And it's only at the second part that we begin to see the themes of dementia care. And so the reason we did the first part is that everybody I know says, it's not getting a diagnosis that's the start, it's realizing something is wrong. Yeah. So once you have gone through all of that first part, now you're to the themes. And the themes are, you've got to get the correct diagnosis, then managing care at home, the transition to long-term care, which is extremely painful. And for some of our cultures, African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American, Native American, they don't use long-term care or memory care because it's seen as an insult to the family. And, and they get a lot of grief from their own loved ones and neighbors and members at church that they're doing something wrong. And so we've always got to do extra support for the families that are in long-term care. Then becomes end of life care and the grief that you have and bereavement as you watch your loved ones slowly die. And those are very real things. And they're things that we're only now beginning to truly appreciate the compassion fatigue and the stress that this takes on a family. And as all of this is going along, 
you're still trying to figure out how to get that diagnosis. And so you've got to find a diagnosis center because the true test is a whole series of tests. It's not one thing, it's multiple things that they're doing, the physicians are doing to rule out anything else it could be until they can come back to what it finally is. So it's not the mini mental status exam, Glenda, as you well know, it's an MRI, a CAT scan, a spinal tap to draw fluid, to look for proteins that shouldn't be in that fluid. Those proteins indicate Alzheimer's, they could indicate Lewy body dementia. It's certain types of blood work and the blood work is looking for hormones out of balance like homocysteine, vitamin D is in Delta, not being correct, vitamin B12, B is in Bravo, not being at the correct level, thyroid being out of balance, all of those things can make a person appear to have a dementia when they don't. These are things that are treatable. They do an EEG, an EKG, PET scan, spec scans. They're measuring electrical activity in the brain and in the body. They're doing tests where they're putting radioactive dye into the brain as part of the scans to see damage to see if the brain lights up in a certain area, it tells them that it's a certain type of dementia. You may not understand the slums test, the Montreal test, or the MOCA test are used, not the mini mental status exam. That's a test for orientation. The Bristol ADL scale is used because the ADL scale used in this country was developed in 1953 for normal aging. The Bristol scale is from Bristol Medical School of Bristol, England, and it was designed specifically for dementia care to give your doctor a true history of what's happening at home. And then the person's history and neuropsych testing to measure what areas of the brain that they can see just through testing are damaged. And so you finally, for many people, Glenda, and you know this because of your career, finally a diagnosis that may come years after you started trying to get a physician or a medical professional to understand something was wrong with your loved one. And that of course is something Glenda, you and I see all the time. And then now that you have a name, a, a reason for the behaviors and you get a name for the monster and, and knowing the name of the monster, I believe helps Glenda. It doesn't mm -hmm. fix it, I can't fix it for you but knowing the name of the monster helps. And so let me tell you about an older rancher. Uh, actually, someone told the dentist in the town that I'm from that I live nearby and I, I will come see you for dementia. And so the family called me and I said, I'll come and see you. And as I got there, of course, people with dementia, very suspicious, what are you here for? But he was very friendly. And of course I brought food. I always bring, strudel or a donut or something. I know they've got a sweet tooth and I'm coming prepared. Plus it's socially appropriate for me to do that. As I sat and talked with him and his family, he got very, very comfortable. And finally I asked him, are you having memory issues? And he said, I, I really do think I am. And I said, well, would you like me to test you? And he said, if you could do that, please. And I said, can we ask your family to leave the room? Cause I don't want to take a test with people watching me. And he goes, me neither. They left the room. I gave him the slums test. The slums test has a 98% validity rating, meaning it is extremely accurate. And he failed it. The test results showed that he had dementia of some, some type. And when I told him that, he started crying, Glenda. And then he grabbed my hand. And he said, you don't know how much this means to me. I thought I was going crazy, but I have a brain disease. That's what I have, right? And I said, yes, sir, you have a brain disease. You're not crazy. And Glenda, it was the first time I realized that somebody with dementia might be feeling crazy and to be told they have a dementia and we're gonna help you find out which one it is so we know the best way to treat you for the rest of your life brought him comfort mm -hmm. because he thought he was crazy. That speaks volumes to me about what we can do for others. Now, of course, these are the nine most common forms of dementia. And these nine dementias make up 98% of all of the dementias. There are 128 identified dementias so far, about 70 of, the, uh, 70 of them are referred to as children's Alzheimer's. So children develop terrible brain diseases. Some of them are so rare, we only see them once or twice a year worldwide. Some of them only happen if something else happened like your 
Uh, we see now a lot, Glenda, with Vietnam veterans who are exposed to Agent Orange. So that adds a toxic dementia on top of their other dementia. But the way this works is you take your person, their sex and their age and their clinical features, and then you remove every dementia they cannot have so that you can go back to the doctor with better questions. So Glenda, if I did my mother, my mother's 83 years old. She never played football. I can mark off number nine. Number nine is football dementia. My, I can't, oh, my family doesn't have, I can't see the whole screen. My family doesn't have Huntington's. Huntington's is inherited. So I can mark Huntington's off. And at 83, my mother would have died 50 years ago. So I can take Huntington's off. Winter key Korsakoff is alcohol dementia. My mother's not had, never had a drink of alcohol in all alcohol in her life, so I can take that one off. She doesn't have Parkinson's disease, Glenda, so she can't have Parkinson's disease dementia. She's way too old for FTDs. These are the dementia of people in their 50s and 60s. When we see a younger person with dementia, the training is you immediately think FTD, not Alzheimer's. My mother doesn't have FTD. She's too old. My mother doesn't have Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies has four distinct hallucinations. They see children. They see bug spiders, rats, and snakes crawling on them and biting them. They see bad people coming to get them. And Glenda, they can describe what sounds like a SWAT team, what sounds like an army. They can describe what sounds like their daughter or son is planning to kill them. And so that daughter or son wouldn't be able to visit until that passed. And the fourth hallucination is they see their caregiver having sex in public with multiple people right in front of them, sex, sex, sex everywhere. My mother doesn't have any of that, so I am confident to mark off Lewy bodies. But my mother has obesity and cellulitis and high blood pressure and AFib. She has high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia. Three times a year, she gets pneumonia and gets hospitalized for it. She grew up with a father who smoked roll your own bull durham, and my father smoked unfiltered palm oils. So my mother has certainly been exposed to cigarette smoke, cigar smoke, and on top of that, everything that I just mentioned is vascular. So I wanna put a check next to vascular dementia. In the 80s, your odds are one in six of developing Alzheimer's dementia. And we know now, Glenda, if you have any other dementia live long enough, Alzheimer's will join it. So I'm gonna put a check next to Alzheimer's too. And when I go back for my mother, I'm gonna ask about number three, number two, and that combination would be called a mixed dementia. That makes sense? Yes, it does. So it gives you a chance to go back to the doctor with some better questions about what's going on. Now, you got to explain the disease to the kids and the grandkids, but you can't use things like grandma's brain is sick. And the reason is, Glenda, I get sick, you get sick, but to a little kid, if I tell them grandma's brain is sick, then they get sick with a cold or a virus or something, and they think, oh, I'm going to be sick like grandma because that's what sick is. And so you've, you've got to be not, it, it's going to be on whatever their level is, but grandma's brain isn't well. Grandma's brain has a disease and you've got to be able to sit down and explain it because the children can feel something's wrong. And we already know that a lot of caregiving in our country for grandparents with dementia is being done by teenage grandchildren who don't understand why is grandma mad at me? Why did grandma yell at me? Why did granddad hit me? He never did that before. You have to explain the disease, including that they can't see you. So you've always got to approach from the front and make sure you're in their eyes. Otherwise, they don't see you. And the striking of you may simply be because you scared them when you approached them and they finally realized you were there. But we've got to have conversations with family members and talk to them about what is happening to our loved one because you need that support. The second part is managing at home and managing at home. These are the things that the community does. If you didn't realize, this is why we know that in stage five, you're doing the work of 12 professionals, because if your loved one was in a uh, memory care or a skilled facility, you have a nurse taking care of medications and a nurse aid giving medications. You have a housekeeping staff. You have a food staff. They're doing all the shopping. The finances are all taken care of. If your loved one needs to go anywhere, they have a driver to take them. 
they're taking care of all the household stuff. None of the mail can get there. And if you have a family member that doesn't need to be visiting your loved one, they can stop them from coming into the community and keep the weasels away. And if your loved one's at home, you're having to try to do all of these things by yourself. And that is what is so incredibly hard. At the conference yesterday, Glenda, there was a gentleman that had dementia that was sitting in the middle of the conference. And on one side was his wife. And on the other side was his daughter who had a master's in social work. And she didn't want her father moved into memory care, but she wasn't doing any of the care. She didn't live with him. She didn't do the care. And you could see how it was wearing on her mother. And so the conversation was, your father's reached the, past the point where he needs to be in care because otherwise you'll lose both parents. And I realized that can be so hard for everybody because especially girls, if you were a daddy's girl or you're a boy and you were a mama's boy, whatever that connection is with that parent, moving them can make it so difficult. But if you're managing at home, you need to find a way to support the primary caregiver. And that means taking your vacation and coming. That means coming on the weekend and giving them a break because we've got to support our family caregiver due to the high death rate. Now, on average, Glenda, people with dementia have one behavioral episode a day. And so remember, they're making that average out of the person who has zero and the person who has 10. So what if my loved one at home has zero behavioral episodes, Glenda, but your loved one is having 10 to 20 episodes a day? Much, much more stressful. And part of it is being driven because you and I are giving the wrong answer. We keep pointing out what they're doing wrong. They have brain damage. They don't know they're doing anything wrong. And because of dementia, the brain doesn't realize it has dementia. So every time you tell them something they're doing wrong, all you do is make them mad. Now, Glenda, my grandmother used to say, you can get happy in the same clothes you got unhappy in. That'll be best. <laughs> but people with dementia can't do that. Once they're upset, it can easily take sleep and tomorrow before they're back to being how they normally are. And they pick up on our emotions. So if I come in around a person with dementia and I'm stressed and agitated, I'm very quickly going to get a very agitated person with dementia. And I don't want those behavioral episodes. I want every day to be as smooth as possible. Remember that your loved one, you may have arguments with them regarding weird behaviors that they don't even remember doing, that they're not safe to drive a car, that they can't go do this stuff anymore, that they can't be responsible for their own medicine. I saw a woman last week, Glenda, she showed me her three heart medicines. Every one of them was dated for October of last year and every bottle was full. And I said, these are from October. And she said, yes, I take them every day. And I said, but I'm counting them and the bottle's full. You're not taking them. And she said, I know, I take them every day. Oh, bless I can't heart. argue with her. She believes she's taking them every day. But my call to adult protective services was, she's a danger because she's not taking her heart medicine and doesn't understand that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sadly. Horribly, horribly. I have to keep moving things around. And then the disease progresses and suddenly, Glenda, the anger can be focused on you. And what we, what is not uncommon to see is that the anger gets focused on the favorite child who has never, had the parent mad at them before and it shatters you. And the way I think of it is that that person with dementia is throwing themselves against the rock and you're the rock. And what you've got to keep saying to yourself is this isn't my mother anymore. This is my mother with dementia and you can't keep those memories. And the more you repeat a memory, Glenda, the stronger the memory gets. And the more you repeat a bad memory, the worse the bad memory gets because your brain begins to add other stuff into it. You've got to remember who your person was when they had a complete brain because that's not who they are now. Now they're slowly becoming someone else. And the exhaustion that it takes for you to deal with this anger or with this confusion or with this behavior just continues to further physically and mentally task you. And that takes a toll 
over years. You got to remember, Glenda, the cancer family caregiver is a caregiver two years. The dementia family caregiver is a caregiver 10 or more years before they begin to look for outside help and typically before their person ever gets diagnosed. Now, you remember that you had friends and they came for dinner and they came for golf, and tennis, poker, bridge, mahjong, brunch, holidays, weekends. Y'all had a great time together. Everybody loved your loved one. And then all of a sudden you get ghosted and there's no more friends. And now you're supposed to be the activity director and you may not understand how to, how to do activities, how to do art activities, even though you can go online now, if you'll put in art for dementia people, you'll get all kinds of stuff you can do with your loved one. Because in a community that's run properly, we do activities from nine in the morning till nine o'clock at night, because that's how human beings live. But you can find stuff to do for your loved one. And that can be very difficult and challenging if you don't realize activities through the day are a critical part of keeping your person engaged and happy and actually aging as well with the disease as they can. Doing exercise is critical. And Glenda, when I was first a social worker, I was over the activity department. That was part of my job. And I told the activity director, I said, what, what you're doing is not working. We're going to have exercise every single day at nine o'clock. And she immediately said, well, you know, uh, so many of these people can't stand. And I said, well, that's okay. We're gonna do wheelchair exercises. We are gonna do chair exercises with your residents every single day. And I'll be by to check on it. Do you know in six months that activity director lost 64 pounds doing wheelchair <laughs> exercises? <laughs> And she told me, she said, if I'd known it was a weight loss program for me, I'd have been doing this for years. You got to do exercise. And the exercise is not only for you. And so, Glenda, if my person's in stage five, we're going to put on the video. We're going to do the exercise. If they're in stage six, I'm going to sit apart from them, across from them and say, do this with me. And I'm doing range of motion. I'm doing stretching. And then, Glenda, I, I didn't find it. Somebody in a community in Dallas gave it to me cost them four dollars at an Asian market and it's a, a glove that fits partially over your hand that has little ball bearings on it and it's a massage glove you can go on Amazon and get them they cost four or five dollars and I took it immediately over to the dementia community and begin to rub people's backs not their spine you can't you gotta be careful around that bone but to just do that and I realized these people haven't had deep back touch in years their spouse is gone, the, the COVID couldn't touch them, couldn't hug them. And when you did their legs with this little hand massage glove, when you did their backs, we saw people smile that we hadn't seen smile in years. We heard people go, ah, because it released pressure points that you don't even realize you had. And Glenda, where does stress build up in humans? Right back here on the shoulders and the neck. And then where do most humans hurt? In our lower back. And so something as simple as chair exercise and a massage glove will do tremendous things for your loved one in terms of using up energy, in terms of helping a human still do something of value. And when you get that $5 massage glove and use it on your loved one, you're gonna be so proud of how good that tiny little gesture made them feel. Socialization is critical. And Glenda, we know the more socialized a person is, the slower the progression of their dementia appears to be. And so one of the reasons that people do well in a skilled setting or in memory care is because there is suddenly activity and socialization. You know what happens when you and I uh, live together, Glenda? And we've been living together and we've been married for 50 or 60 years. We don't necessarily have conversations the way another couple does. We do a lot of our conversations with eyebrows and facial mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that need for socialization is important. And if all of your friends have ghosted you, who comes over to help socialize? And eventually your person becomes, you, you've stopped going to church or synagogue because it's too much time to get your person ready and then get yourself ready. And then if you get them there, what if they create a havoc while they're in the church? instead of getting somebody from the church to be responsible for your loved ones so that you can go to your religious activity 
which we know is critical for you because socialization is also key for the caregiver. Do, 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 do. Really sorry about these curtains on each of the slides and mm. want to apologize for that. You have to be a nurse. You have to do nursing care for your loved one and that can be scary for you. And then when you get a nurse, we face ageism in our country. And some of you listening today may have already faced ageism with your own physician. I know a, a perfectly normal aging 92 year old woman who went to her primary care physician because of pain. And he said to her, what do you expect you're 92? And Glenda, I believe she had a come to Jesus meeting with him. She was terribly articulate and very, very firm. But that is something that we frequently see in dementia care and in any of our older population getting to the doctor is that no one may take you seriously because they look at you and they look at your age and they don't get it that you're still a human and you deserve that care. And then there is the stigma of dementia. Glenda and you and I both know that there is a stigma that your friends ghost you, that other people talk to you strangely, that you go to the doctor with your loved one and the doctor won't even make eye contact with your loved one. We know that if paramedics come to your house and you tell them your loved one has fallen and they have dementia, they will treat them roughly. But if you said they have brain cancer, they'll treat them like fine glass. Mm. And that's something that shouldn't, that shouldn't even be something we're talking about. And it's because of the fact that people don't realize dementia means the brain is dying and that person's not doing anything on purpose. They are simply responding to brain damage. And if you don't realize that, you don't do anything. So you go to the doctor and you tell them that, and this is what happens. As you tried to tell your doctor, something's different about your loved one, nothing. And they ignored you and you didn't know what else you were supposed to do. And so as the disease progresses, you now begin the transition to long-term or memory care if there are funds available. And Glenda, they keep building memory care communities like everybody's got millions and millions of dollars. And the reality is that most people don't. And the generation that saved money is the generation that's dying. And so that transition should happen. We hope it happens because we know people get better care in care because it's licensed staff and they're trained to watch for delirium, UTIs, the nurses are there, the doctors come there, everything comes there versus having to get your loved one out. But some of you won't be able to do that because of funds and you've got to find a way to take care of your loved one through that final part of the disease and not die too. And that means using respite care, using family members and friends to come give you a break. And a lot of times, Glenda, you and I run into families that don't realize I can put my loved one in a nursing home for a week. I'll have to pay for it at the private pay level, but they were gonna charge me the private pay level anyway. But if I can put my loved one in there for a week or two, I can go see new grandbabies that were born during COVID I haven't seen. I can go home and sleep and actually sleep and not have to worry about somebody trying to get out of the house in the middle of the night. So for some families, the transition is not to long-term or memory care. The transition is to intermittent respite care so that I don't go bankrupt and end up homeless, but that my loved one can still get care from me, but I can add in respite care to try to help that. For other families, the reality is your loved one will go into memory care or into long-term care. And then as you make that transition, Glenda, how many times have you and I listened to the guilt a family member feels and to their self-doubt that they have done something wrong by seeking medical care for their loved one? When if the word was cancer, there wouldn't be that process, that emotion happening. And so as spouses begin to have this self-doubt and begin to feel this guilt, it affects their own health. And that's why the death rate for the caregivers is so high. It is the stress of doing the physical care that takes a team of us to do. 
and it is the guilt and doubt that you have about whether or not you're doing the right thing. Does that make sense, Glenda? Yes, it does. Happened in my own family. And then you have the role of the adult child and their guilt and grief is not the same as the spouses. And a lot of times that's because they have not been there doing the care the spouse had done. Just like the young woman I met yesterday. She didn't want daddy moved into memory care, but memory care was the best option for them and they had the funds and the insurance for it. And that would give us a better guarantee that the wife would survive the disease. But it was so hard for her to think about letting go of her daddy. And you can feel like you're, you're abandoning them. And on the day of the move, Glenda, nobody gets the family prepared for this is going to feel like the funeral. Because when you come back that day to your home, you're aware that your loved one won't be there. They won't be coming back there anymore. And it's the same way you felt at a funeral. They won't be there anymore. And you may not be prepared for that emotion, but it's gonna hit you. And so for that reason, we wanna make sure that if your loved one is moved, even if it's into respite for just a few weeks, you need to do something nice for yourself that day. You need to come home, have a nice meal, get it from your favorite restaurant, have a bubble bath, watch your favorite movie, watch comedy, or just peace and quiet. It's okay. You're going to get through this, but you got to have things ready at the house for you. And you got to start turning that energy back into your own life and start to make that break. Your loved one has a terminal brain disease and they're going to get the best care they can, but we need you to be the survivor. Does that make sense, Glenda? Yes. Don't sound happy, Glenda. No, <laughs> it's not a happy topic. It's, it's, it's not. I've gotten tearful twice. And then in family dynamics, the change can either make things better or worse. We frequently, I have seen families that pull together during dementia, uh, children that fly in from different areas of the country, and each of them takes a week to give the parent a break. I have seen families completely fracture and break apart because of the disease process. And either one of those is normal. And throughout all of this, post-death grief has now begun for you, the family caregiver, for you, the spouse. And post-death grief means that you are grieving for your loved one as though they had already died, even though they're sitting right over there in that chair. And that people have a hard time processing because nobody told you you could have post-death grief. And some of that grief is unearned guilt. Now, Glenda, there's earned guilt and learned guilt. Earned guilt is I did something I shouldn't have done and I should feel guilty about it. Learned guilt is somewhere in your life, you got a message that you're somehow responsible for things you're not responsible for. That's mm -hmm. learned guilt. And you're not moving your loved one because you don't love them. You're moving them because they need a higher level of care than you can provide. And the care you're providing is killing you. And so the grieving process begins in earnest in a way that you did not feel earlier. When post-death grief begins, it takes a tremendous emotional toll on you to the point that you may not be able to visit. And I, I can't tell you you're a bad person if you don't visit. Glenda, I saw somebody the other day that said, they just couldn't visit this person anymore that they'd known all their life because they couldn't bear to see what the disease had done to him. And that was a family friend, not a child. And we see that same behavior with adult children who say, I don't want to go there because that's not daddy anymore. And it makes me sad. Now, people say to me frequently that they have a child in denial, a spouse in denial, a uh, person with dementia is in denial. Well, the person with dementia isn't in denial. The brain doesn't recognize that it's damaged. It's a nosenosia, the inability of the brain to realize it has dementia. So every time you point out something they're doing wrong, you just make them angry. You have, um, and I've lost my train of thought here, Glenda. What was I telling you? <laughs> this is how it starts. Look at the slide and maybe it'll come back to you. <laughs> 
Okay, so the point of this was that as they begin to do research onto the children, and as I would hear people say that so-and-so's in denial, the, my answer has always been, the person with dementia is not in denial, they have a nosnosia. The spouse and the children are probably not in denial, they don't understand the disease. And then we did the research, Glenda, mm-hmm. and here's what happens. Typically, one child becomes the caregiver. That's right. the child that steps up to the plate and is there to help. And the others literally watch or pretend it's not real. And so as we go through and look at the research, child number one sees that there is a condition and it's the disease of the brain and it is affecting their loved one and they need help and support. Child number two Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the birth order. This is just child number two. Is an adult child who sees that dementia is there and that's a disease, but they're not really able to make the connection that that brain disease is causing these behaviors. And instead, they simply focus on these behavioral symptoms and are mad at the parent or the spouse. Well, it would be the, the parent because they're not behaving correctly. And remember, Glenda, I had a family who the wife, had a frontal temporal dementia and she had a form of it called PPA and she had one of the forms of PPA which meant that she couldn't use language. Well now one of the interesting thing about the frontal temporal dementia primary progressive aphasia group is that somebody who never painted before can't use language correctly and eventually doesn't have language or speech at all but suddenly can paint like Rembrandt Mm. and that began to do it. Her child who lived on the other side of the coast said that his mother didn't actually have anything wrong with her. She was pretending that she couldn't speak because he wasn't paying enough attention and giving her enough praise for her artwork. And his brother was a hospice doctor. And during our meeting, the brother tried diligently to explain that's not she's not doing that you're witnessing one of the odd things about frontal temporal dementias and you could not get that child to understand it they just kept saying no no it's just a behavior she's doing child number three just thinks dementia is part of normal aging and so for everybody on here dementia is not normal aging normal aging is you and I will live and die at home our brain will continue to function throughout our life our brain actually gets richer and thicker and stronger as we age but we have ageism in our country and so you don't get that message so dementia is a disease of aging but it is certainly not normal aging adult child number four if the curtains ever open, isn't quite sure how to make sense of all the conditions or the behaviors that they're seeing, but they're not concerned enough to get engaged in care with the other parent or the other adult children. And then my favorite child is adult child number five, who doesn't seem to be aware or acknowledge that anything is going on with their parent. And so I bet you, Glenda, if we ask for hands to raise, I bet you today on this call, we have families who've got child number one, child number two, child number three, number four, and sadly, number five as well. And you know, the one who usually makes the most trauma is number five. Your friends may suddenly reappear in your loved one's life, and some of them may need to be banned. And I say this, Glenda, because Mm -hmm. I know someone whose mother has vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is hard. It is really hard for families because they're part of the day where they seem normal, part of the time they seem normal, and then other times they seem completely demented. And you thought, okay, they're normal, it's okay. And then later on you thought, well, maybe I'm crazy and they're doing something totally different that I don't understand. And so this particular lady had a friend that she knew that figured out or found out the community that the mother had been moved to, that her friends had moved, that the the lady lived in. And the lady's friend began to call her every day. And every day she spent at least 30 minutes telling the woman that your husband is dead. I don't know why you keep asking about him. He's dead. He's been dead for two years. This is what happened at the funeral. This is what was going on. And she spent a huge amount of time doing this. And of course, all it did was traumatize the the lady. 
her daughter, after a couple of weeks, figured out mom's totally different. Mom is upset every day. What is happening? The daughter called the community and said, what is going on that's making mother so unhappy? And she found out her mother was getting this phone call every day. And so she banned the woman to keep her from upsetting her loved one because their reality is our reality. And when they're looking for a deceased loved one, we don't say your loved one's dead. Why would we wanna traumatize someone like that again? And this woman just couldn't understand that. And so your friends that ghosted you may come back and then you're gonna need to ban them for your loved one's safety and for your own mental health. You also have to remember through this is the cycle of life. People will ask me, well, how much longer will they live? Well, I'm looking at multiple things. We know by demographics that after the age of 25, 79 to 80% of us will die in the cycle of our birth. And the cycle is 30 days before your birthday, Glenda, and 60 days after. I'm born in the fall, I'll die in the fall. My mother's born in the summer, she will die in the summer. And unless it's war, an accident, or some sort of heart-saving procedure, you had a heart attack and they saved you, with, with those things being the 20% that don't die in the cycle of life, the rest of us, we expect, will die then. So when I'm looking at your loved one, I'm always counting how many months away are we from a birthday and are we beginning to see the decline into death? Because just like our sponsors do hospice care, hospice care is something we want in place the final year of life, not the final three days. They can't even get all the equipment to your house. So when I look at a loved one, I am looking at their birthday, Glenda, and I am looking to see, am I seeing a decline that would indicate to me they've entered the process of actively dying? And actively dying takes nine months, just like the process of conception to birth took nine months. There is a season and purpose to life, Glenda. And then families have to start the long goodbye and the long goodbye began much longer than other families realize unless they've also been on this journey. And you go through Kubler-Ross's stages of grief over and over and over again. You know, a lot of times, Glenda, think, people think Kubler-Ross's stages are stages for death, but it's grief for loss. So it could be the loss of a job, the loss of a friend, the loss of your loved one, and watching your loved one slowly become a shell of who you used to know. A good friend told me once, she said, that woman looks like my mother. At times she sounds like my mother, but that's not my mother anymore. And that's a normal thing for families to feel. And it's also normal that you may go through these stages over and over again with each subsequent decline of your loved one, because nobody can tell you how bad it's going to get, but it just keeps getting worse. And that's hard for me to explain to you and to help you understand that this disease by the end, if your loved one lived into stage seven, your loved one will die looking like they were in a concentration camp because that's how ravaging brain disease is. And so families unprepared for that as they see their loved one decline may go through these grief stages over and over and over. In the final days, we know that it's important you give your loved one permission to go. Now, don't do like my friend Betsy. Betsy got there. Her mother was dying. Betsy scooped her mother up in her arms. She held her close and she said, Mama, Mama, we love you. We love you. If you're ready to go, you go ahead and go. We love you. God's waiting on you. Heaven is ready. Love you. Love you. You can go. And then Betsy stood back and looked at her mother. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm waiting for her to die. <laughs> because why? And she said, well, they say you're supposed to give them permission. I gave her permission. Won't she die now? And I said, no, <laughs> the human body takes time to shut down. It's, it's about a week long process. It, this is not, you give her permission and they go, oh, okay, but it doesn't happen like that. But as you go through these final days, you will see all of these things begin to happen. And Glenda, Probably everybody on here knows of somebody who was dying and then suddenly seemed to wake up and ask for their favorite meal. And the family brought them their favorite meal. They ate their meal. The family shouts, hallelujah. They go home. And what happens that night? They die. They die. And that is an around the world thing that happens with families. 
on your actively dying tool and you can go to the website tamcummings.com and if you'll scroll all the way down you'll find the tools that you need and these tools are so you can stage your loved one so you can measure your stress level so you can do the bristol adl scale so that your doctor sees what your loved one is really like and you have the final part of life built into the staging tools in the final hours, this is the order in which the body begins to shut itself down. And these things are all normal things that happen. But Betsy told me as her mother died, she said, if you hadn't been here, I don't think we would have known what to do because they didn't have VTOS. It wasn't there. And they didn't have that kind of support. And you've got to be prepared for what is going to happen. And so that material that you can download off the website for free, happy for you to have it, will help you be able to help other family members understand what's happening and to help you know that the things you're seeing in the final hours of life are all normal. It's just how the human body ceases function. And then in death, there will be a final breath and usually a paw sound is not, that's not unusual to hear. There may be spittle or foam at the corner of the mouth and the body will immediately appear to shrink. And Glenda, that's the belief the soul is leaving the body. The body becomes pale and cool and gray because there's no longer red oxygenated blood. And that's what part of our coloring comes from. The eyes and mouth are typically open in death. That's not a grimace. That's not a scream. That is how the human body dies. The eyes and mouth are shut at the funeral home. The eyes are flattened because the eyes are more rounded because of blood pressure. There's no more blood pressure. And the body may have a final electrical charge movement through it. And the body may release urine or stool uh, once all of the muscles have relaxed. And then grief and bereavement, the fifth part of the journey, begin again. You may feel numbness. And it's normal, Glenda, for the three days around the funeral for you not to remember anything. And it's thought that perhaps the brain is doing something where it's shifting memory of your loved one from present tense to past tense, but most people don't remember those three days. You may feel great anger. You may feel regrets. You may find yourself feeling worse, having physical or strange sensations. And even though you go to the doctor, the doctor can't find a causation. And it's because the causation of those feelings is actually grief. You may have outbursts. Glenda, your husband asked for a cup of coffee and you chopped his head off. It wasn't the coffee, it wasn't him, it was your grief that happened. You may have surprises and forgetfulness where you find yourself calling your loved one or turning your car to drive to their house, picking up the phone because you've got news and then you realize they're not here anymore. And if it was dementia, Glenda, your first thought is not, I'm grieving. Your first thought is, oh my God, I've got it too. And then families can have reoccurring pictures where they continue to see the final part of life over and over again. And you need to let that go. That's not who your loved one was. And it is very common, Glenda, for people to have dreams about their loved one, especially immediately following the death. And it's also very common after the funeral that when you get back to the house, you may see your loved one walking down the hallway. And that is seen all over the world but in our country, we are so afraid someone will think we're crazy that no one talks about it. But it is completely normal for you to see or feel anything unusual or odd. So you got to find a support group and they are virtual. They are in person. You have them with WellMed. You have um, all kinds of companies that do that. You have Alzheimer's Association. We have all kinds of virtual support groups out there to help you. A new way of counting time will begin, Glenda, and it doesn't become the year 2023. It becomes the first Mother's Day, the okay. second Father's Day, the third Christmas. And that will go on for a significant amount of time. When you grieve a parent or a spouse that you loved, the grieving takes at least a decade. Now for a child, whether it's an adult child or an infant child, that grief lasts a lifetime. That is a, a different grief. And then hopefully, as you get through this time, your support group friends will come there and they will be the people that are there with you at the end. And it may not be friends you'd ever known before, but it will be the other people that have walked this journey that will be there for you 
at the end. And so support groups are critical and literally save your life. Now I know that this is hard stuff to hear. And so let's just stop for a second and do breathing. And remember, this is our count for meditative or prayer breath. So I want you to put your feet on the floor, hands in your lap. You can shut your eyes if you want to. Glenda's not looking. And, and you're going to breathe in to the count of four, hold for the count of two, and breathe out to the count of six. We're going to do that four times, and I'm going to do your count. So feet flat on the floor, hands in your lap. You can shut your eyes if you want to. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out. Two, three, four, five, six. Deep breath in. Two, three, four, hold. Hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Last time, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Now, Glenda, we breathe out longer than we breathe in so that we can slow respiration. So if I'm going to visit a loved one, before I get out of my car, I do four breaths like this. And when I finish the visit, when I'm back in my car, before I get back on the highway, I do four more breaths to get myself calm and ready and centered to go back to my home. So for everybody going through this, use your meditation. You can get free stuff on YouTube. Get in a support group. You can get in them virtually they will be the people that help you get through this and save your life. And if you believe you have a child that is standing up to the plate and another child that seems completely out of touch, you're actually seeing that. And it had nothing to do with something you did wrong in their upbringing. There is apparently five different types of children that respond to dementia in those different ways. Okay, Glenda. All right. Tell me better to be really depressed now. Yeah, look at me. I'm going crazy. My pick. But anyway, I'll take it off and hear my. Um, what's your time frame today, Cam? Um, nobody's. Well, two people have walked in this room, but the dogs haven't barked, and I'm hanging out. So, how all right. So, let's do some. Let's do some questions then. Uh, Christina asks, "How would diabetes influence the type of dementia and/or the progression of the disease?" It doesn't influence the type of dementia. It um, makes it worse. Diabetes interferes with the blood brain barrier and that's how nutrition goes to the brain. And that's also how, um, when the brain cleans itself at night, it, it cleans itself through the blood brain barrier and diabetes interferes with that. Mm. So yeah. it, it's not a specific thing. It's just, it makes anybody's dementia worse. Uh, somebody being hard of hearing their dementia is worse. Somebody with macular degeneration, their dementia is going to be worse. So it's one more bad thing happening to them that is just going to affect how the disease progresses and it'll progress more rapidly. Mm, yeah. Um, Barbara wanted to know if you could address FTD and eating obsession. That is, you're describing behavioral variant FTD and the hallmark feature is the person will fixate on a particular food. I've seen somebody eating 20 Big Macs a day. Just Ooh. if you're keeping count, that's like $125 a day for Big Macs. And then what do you think the afternoon is like? Blech. I knew somebody eating almost 200 bananas a day. I knew somebody eating sugar straight out of, they poured it in a bowl like it was cereal. And when he ran out of sugar, he'd hop in the car and go get more. I knew somebody who was eating five gallons of Rocky Road ice cream a day. Now, Glenda, that one I can actually make a pretty good call for. I mean, ice cream, yummy. Mm, but yeah. it is a hallmark feature of behavioral variant FTD. And the person tends to gain 20 to 40 pounds in only wow. a few months because of this sudden craving for food. Wow. Mm. So go to T-H-E, A as in alpha, ftd.org. So Glenda, that's the Association of Frontal Temporal Dementia.org. 
there will be a red bar in the middle of the front page. Click on that bar, that's the menu. Go to what is FTD and it will bring up all the different forms. And when you get to behavioral variant, you'll see the explanation that will look like your loved one. Then you can go to my website and download the FTD staging tool. When you get your tool downloaded and the FTD tool is about seven pages long, you find the dementia your loved one has, which is behavioral variant FTD, and you follow down that column. If there's an X in the box, then the behavior in the left-hand side of the page is associated with that form of FTD. But when you get to stage six, there are no more X's because at stage six, all dementias are considered the same because of the amount of brain loss, okay? And that's why you need to know the name of the monster because then you can educate yourself about the specific disease, mm -hmm. right? And then you understand that these behaviors that they're doing are normal for that dementia. And if I did the same thing to your brain, you'd behave the very same way. Right. So mm -hmm. we looked back around to the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl expressed that she was feeling very sad and wanted to know if it's inevitable. And I responded to her that's a terminal illness and that is very sad. So, but here's a big thing, Glenda. Before the onset of dementia, about 10 years before, we see the onset of depression and it goes untreated. Mm. If you'll go to my website, you can download the geriatric depression scale and you can take the test for your loved one based on how well you know them and what's happened in the last week. And the answer page is right there next to it. And once you finish doing the depression test on your loved one, do the depression test on yourself. Right. There are generation four antidepressants now, Glenda, and they go to work in three to four days, not five to six weeks. So imagine that you go to your doctor, you get the medicine, and all of a sudden next Wednesday at about 10 o'clock in the morning, you're going to realize, oh my gosh, I haven't felt like this since I was and your mind will go back to when the depression started. And it'll tell you, I haven't felt like this since I was 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever your age is. Right. But you'll get a note from your brain saying, thank you. I feel better now. Yeah. And how could you not be depressed, Glenda, no. as you watch your loved one die so slowly? Mm -mm. No, it no. is sad. Very yeah, sad. The support the cancer families have. So it is horrible. Yeah. Really horrible. And so I put in the chat box, uh, Tam's uh, website is www.tamcummings.com. And you really can call her um, at 254-421-3668. No, 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 no. Oh, did I mess it up? Yeah, 254-216-3668. Oh man, I'm sorry, y'all. I'll correct that in the chat box. I just screwed that up royally. Anyway, you can. 216-3668. Well, I went to your text messages and the other was what it told me. But anyway, I'll fix it over here. Um, and she she would love to hear from me if you have more questions need or her assistance, but she's busy. And so leave her a detailed message and your name and phone number and she'll get back with you. Um, Let's see, Sandy says, Lewy body dementia. Is there a good book explaining this dementia? Um, go to lbd.org, which is lewybodydementia.org. And then in the itty bitty dementia book on my website, there's a section on all the dementias in chapter four on the nine most common dementias. So you'll get information there. But you could start with Lewy, lbd.org. And then also, Glenda, if you'll go to NIH.gov and type in Lewy Body Booklet, you should be able to get about a 40-page booklet from the federal government for free. That is one of the best things you can get on Lewy Body because it'll help you with the stages. It'll help you understand the medications and what your person is going through. Excellent. I will be, or we will be sending out a follow-up email for those that registered for the session today. And I'll include these links uh, for you so that, you know, if you didn't get it, that's all right. You'll get it. Um, let's see. Um, Nicole says, I'm not quite sure where to begin. My mother-in-law has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and my father-in-law has Parkinson's. They're currently living at home. I'm not sure about their budget, et cetera. Any advice on where to begin? 
Uh, well, if your person has Lewy bodies, you're watching for the onset of Parkinson's and then Alzheimer's. If your person has Parkinson's, you're watching for the onset of Lewy body and then Alzheimer's. Um, it would be questionable as to whether the mother-in-law actually has Alzheimer's because unless they saw somebody specialized, they tend to tell everybody you've either got dementia or Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's is maybe 20 to 30% of the dementias. It's not 80 and 90%. It's a much smaller group. So we, you'd need to find out which one they have if you can. And, and you do that by looking at their clinical features. And what you're going to do is, is you've got to find out their assets. And remember, part of the assets are, are their home. you got to look at that. And, and you've got to know their assets because without their assets, you can't build a plan of care. And there are plenty of communities that take couples. And it's not unusual to find a couple where both people have developed a dementia if they've lived long enough. So um, you've just got to start doing your homework. And some of that involves, uh, sometimes we have to be sneaky, Glenda. We have to look yeah. at, well, maybe we're not supposed to be things, you know, we wouldn't normally do, but we've got to think about it as to we're trying to do our best to help this, this person that we love. And so you, you have to start with which dementia is it? What stage of the disease are they in? And what are their assets? Because that determines everything about care. Yeah, for sure. Know That's that it. monster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, try and unmute Bianca's phone. Let's see if I can do that. Hmm. Uh, let's see, is she up here at the top? No. Sorry for taking this time. Uh, Bianca is with us today, and uh, she has some vision impairment, and so I was trying to help her out. Bianca, if you have somebody there with you and you can unmute your phone, if you have um, some questions or comments, I'm sorry, I thought I could do it from here, but I all I can do is ask you to unmute. Um, I corrected Tam's telephone number there for you. Sorry about that, Tam and others. Um, You're unmuted. Ah, oh, there she is. Okay, oh. Bianca, do you have any questions or comments? Oh, I just thought she did a fabulous job and uh, really answered uh, my friend that's here, she's a caregiver for somebody, but it's a friend, not a spouse or, or parent. So it, she got, she was really thrilled to get all this good information. Oh, great. We're so glad you were with us today. Thank you. Um, um, I take care of Bob and he, he, uh, he lives in an RV and um, I've had two neurologists and all they tell me is that he has dementia I mean they didn't give me mm. any information other than that you know after we went through all the tests and everything and well, so there's, she, there's there's something wrong then um okay. so if you can send me the summary page of the testing of uh -huh. the MRI then I'll translate that for you okay. okay but a neurologist um most neurologists don't specialize in dementia mm -hmm. but Anybody who did the round of testing should have given you the correct diagnosis, and it may be on your summary page, and you just don't realize it because it's written in medical terminology. Okay. But if you can, if you can find the MRI summary page and just take a picture of it, text me, mm -hmm. then I'll call you back and tell you what it's actually saying. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. And then you can also use the tools on the website mm -hmm. because they tell the doctor what's actually happening with your loved one. Because when you take your loved one to the doctor, you get them all dressed up and cleaned up. And the doctor doesn't see what you're actually dealing with. Mm -hmm. So use that paperwork to measure your own stress levels, to mm -hmm. stage your person, and to fill out the paperwork that a doctor needs to see to understand what's actually happening. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Did y'all get? Did you get the web address and the phone number and everything? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good. Thank Glad. You. Glad you did. Well, thank All you right. so much. I, I appreciate I, it. I haven't seen part one. Can I, is, I can review that somewhere? You can. It's a podcast on the Caregiver Teleconnection website. You can go back and you can look up Tam's name as a presenter. Okay. And it'll give all the sessions that she has done for us over time. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us today. Um, so, as I said, a follow-up email is going to come out to you if you register for the call today. Um, it will give the resources that Tam was talking about for you. 
Uh, it would also like your feedback on how you thought the session went today. Uh, also, we're always looking for topics. If you have a topic that you would like us to present, let us know what that is and we'll do the research and try and find a presenter that could present that information. Um, let's see, if you, do, oh, if you didn't register the call today and you do wanna get the email with the resources, you can call our customer service representative cold free at 866-390-6400. Nine one, and she'll get that information to you also. Well, we've got about 15 minutes over and that's kind of standard for you and I. Yes, we do that. So Tam, thank you so much for the session today. I look forward to uh, being with you again next month and that'll be April already. And I can't believe the year is flying by. And oh, Glenda. Uh, Glenda, 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 you yeah. and I will be together before then. We're fixing to start a podcast. Well, when we do, and when you're going to do it in February, but I got sick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But March, we're starting our podcast. Well, we can't. Well, have to be the end of March, as you know, I'm not going to be around. Have a safe trip back to Texas. And have you have a safe trip. I will. And we hope to see you all all on that. That's our Texas thing. You all on our next um, session. And so thank you for joining us today and stay well and stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, Wellman. Thank you, Vitas. Thank all of y'all. Hang in there. Hug yourselves. Write a letter to yourself about what a great caregiver you have been. I know that's a hard thing to do, but write it and then put it up. You will want it later. Good luck to all of you. You're in my prayers. And just breathe. Bye-bye. Breathe.